Well, welcome back to Soul Care. Thank you for being open to whatever the Lord wants to teach us all through this class. Um, I personally believe that the, we are facing a harvest that is right at our feet that we possibly are overlooking. And Jesus said this about the harvest. This is Matthew 9, starting in verse 36. It says, when he saw the crowds, he interpreted what he saw. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers, laborers into his harvest. According to a recent CNN poll, 90% of Americans believe that we as a culture are facing a mental health crisis. And the mental health community agrees with that fact. In fact, schools and educational entities are scurrying to try to find and train people to work in the people helping field. Kelsey Theis, president of the Texas Association of School Psychologists, said, we simply don't have enough people in our profession to meet the need. And so since COVID, mental health issues have skyrocketed, depression, anxiety in particular. And so the question that I think we have to ask ourselves is what role does the church play in this crisis? Now, Hopefully, we don't need a crisis to compel us to get in, involved and to engage with hurting people who are, as Jesus interpreted them, harassed and helpless. But we have an opportunity with this crisis, like never before, to step out of our comfort zone, perhaps, and say, you know what? We can help. The church can help in this crisis. The gospel has something to offer people who struggle. That's, I'm first in line when it comes to struggling people. I'm one of those. We all struggle at one level or another. So the church can't remain silent on this. Let me uh, kind of echo what Jason just shared. And last week we covered basic guiding principles for soul care. And tonight we're going to be looking at more relational concepts and how our relationship with people impacts whether or not we are able to help them. So I want you to imagine with me that there is a, an unreached people group and it's an isolated group and they have needs and you have what they need. That might be medicine, that might be the gospel, that might be food, it could be anything. But these people have a need and you have the solution. The problem is they don't know you. And even though you could actually help them, uh, they won't trust you because they don't know you. Somehow you would have to build a bridge, a relationship bridge, to, to enter that person's world or those people, that group of people's world, and, and be able to establish some level of trust. Now, admittedly, trust building is not the easiest thing to do on two fronts. Number one, uh, to establish trust in a brand new relationship with someone you've never met. That's, that can be difficult. Uh, not because you're difficult, but because the other person may have a lot of suspicion or a lot of reasons why they don't just trust you, right? So that can be difficult. It can be even more difficult in, a, in an existing relationship where trust has been either damaged or broken, and you're trying to rebuild that trust. And sadly, we all have people in our lives that, you know, whether we were insensitive or immature or whatever, you know, we, we misused our platform in people's lives. And then they, they were like, well, I don't trust you anymore. And so we have to recover from that. And God will help us to do that. So if we approach the people that have a problem with the solution then we are probably moving in a good direction because hopefully God is leading us in that direction. So 
As we look at soul care and how we can engage people, let me state something that's very important. That is, simplistic approaches to complex problems are not only unhelpful, but can be harmful. If I simplify a complex issue in a person's life, and I just simply say, well, you know, here's what you need to do, and I don't really understand the complications behind that, then I probably am not doing any good and I perhaps am doing something harmful to that person. So it is not enough for us to know the truth. We must also know how to deliver the truth. We have to know how to deliver it. I want to share a couple of illustrations with you. Let's imagine that I have a very awesome, very sharp sword. I actually have one, but I didn't bring it. Uh, and let's, let's say, because a sword is a weapon, right? We could use a, any other weapon, but Paul refers to the Word of God as the sword of the Spirit. So that's the Spirit's weapon. It's his, his instrument, his tool that he uses to change lives and accomplish uh, God's purpose. And so let's imagine I've got this sword, and I'm just wielding it, walk into a crowded room, and I'm wielding it. Uh, two things are not going to happen. Number one you're not going to want to come close to me and have a conversation with me. The, the worst thing that's probably going to happen is, is someone could get hurt because I don't need, I, I, I have to be responsible with this weapon. I have to sheathe it until it is time for it to be used. Another illustration is imagine that you're building a house and you've hired me. I don't know why you would do that, but let's say you did. And you don't know my skill level. You don't know if I can do anything. But you, you send me to, the, uh, to Home Depot and say, hey, we're, we're doing drywall today. Uh, go get some material. So I come back with rolls of drywall tape and buckets of mud. And I put it down in the, in the construction site. And then you say, Tim, I'm so busy on this other project. You go ahead and, and apply that. And so we don't know what the outcome of this would be if I have some experience and I know how to apply these materials, then that job may turn out okay. But if I don't have any experience, I don't know, if, do I grab this mud by, you know, just throw it buckets of, just handfuls of it at the wall? How do I put this on? I don't know. The, the point is there's nothing wrong with the materials. The materials are perfect. But I have to know how to apply that. So we... we Look at the word of God and the power that it has. There's nothing wrong with the gospel. The gospel is, is true and pure and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. But whether or not I know how to apply it is another question. Now, like drywall work, a person can actually learn how to do that. Now, if you've ever done it, you know you might have sore muscles you might have, a, have to have a lot of patience with yourself because that's not an easy task to learn. Uh, the same can be true in this area of handling the Word of God. Let me give you an example. If you're a Sunday school teacher and you have experience collecting information, researching, uh, and then delivering that information in a classroom setting, you're probably really good at that. But that's not the skill you need for soul care. Soul care is a different application when it comes to helping people. The, the gospel is the same in any environment, in any framework, but the way we apply it and how we deliver it may, may be different. So those illustrations, I hope, show at least the drywall illustration is that the what of the gospel, meaning the materials, uh, that's one thing. We need that. We have to have the, the knowledge of Scripture. But the how of ministry, the application of Scripture, is a very different task. So I want us to look at a letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, the first letter. And this is chapter 5. And I want you to see how Paul gives us three basic categories of people. He says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. So there are three categories of care that Paul lays out for us. And each person needs to be a, approached and dealt with in a very different way. For example, those who are unruly, meaning they're disorderly, 
They're undisciplined, insubordinate, idle, lazy. Uh, these people need to be warned. They need to be admonished. They need to be reproved or corrected. They kind of need a swift kick in the spiritual rear, if you will. Uh, because that's what this person needs. That's how we need to care for that person. The second category Paul lays out here is the faint-hearted. Those who are feeble-minded or weak-minded. They're unable to make decisions. They're insecure. They're little-spirited. They struggle in many ways. And Paul said these people must be approached with consolation. We need to, learn, we need to comfort this person. We need to draw near to them. Calm them, encourage them because they're easily upset. And so you're going to, just these two categories show us that you're going to approach one group of people or one type of person very differently from this other type of person. And the third category Paul lays out here is those who are weak or impotent. They are powerless. They are infirm. This could speak of a physical condition. They are without strength. They walk in weakness. And Paul said these people need to be upheld. Up, I'm sorry, upheld. They need to be supported. Uh, it has the, the, the idea of a construction wall, building a wall for them to lean on. These people need you to come near to them and to be committed to them throughout the task. So you might be able to see an unruly person and say, you know what, you need to get your stuff together because it's not going to end well for you. I don't know if you'd say that, but you could. Uh, but you would not say that to a person in the weak category. You would say it's going to be okay. One of the things I love about uh, something Elaine always says is, grief is not a time for correction. If a person is grieving, that is not a time. Even if they're thinking something wrong or they're saying something wrong and you know, oh, that's not, that's not biblical. Don't, don't touch that. Just sit there with that person. Just support that person because that's not the time for correction. Uh, one of the things I used to love to do is iron. I used to iron. Uh, I was a pastor. Of course, I had to prepare for a Sunday sermon. But we have four daughters. And back then in the 80s, everybody wore dresses. And I would iron five dresses before I went to church and had prayer and lead a service. I loved it. And here's why I think I loved it, is because unlike ministry, I could take a garment and watch it transform right before my eyes, immediately. And nothing like that happens in ministry. And, and I remember one day I was ironing all these dresses, and some of them had frills. It took a long time. It was very therapeutic for me. And, I, and this passage came to mind. It's like the Lord brought it to my mind. And said, Tim, people are like garments. Like, here's what I learned about ironing. You cannot turn an iron all the way up and iron a synthetic garment. <laughs> it's not going to work. You will burn, burn a hole in it and destroy it. And I've done that. And so what, what I've had to learn is, oh, I need to know what kind of garment I'm ironing and then set the iron to the temperature that will do the job, right? So if I'm Ironing a synthetic garment, it's a low, low temperature. If it's a, a linen or cotton garment, it's got to be high. Because if I'm ironing linen on a low temperature, guess what I'm doing? Wasting my time. I may feel, it may be therapeutic, but it's not gonna, I'm not going to see transformation. And so it seems that Paul is saying we have to know where that person is that we're, we're seeking to help. We have to understand something about that person be, before we can step into their life and actually give them something that would be beneficial to them. And so I want to look at another passage. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2. This is one of those passages I call process passages. It's, it lays out a process. And notice how Paul does this. He says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Did you get that? Must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, let me just state, Paul doesn't really 
explain what the opponent is, what, what it, they're in opposition to. It could be God. It could be themselves. It could be somebody else. But they are in opposition to something. They're in a fight. And God says, if we don't argue with them when they're in that fight, be gentle, able to teach when it's necessary, patient, and, and you probably will have to correct them, but do it in humility, hoping if perhaps God would, number one, grant them repentance so that, number two, they would know the truth. And this is that word in John 8 where Jesus said, if you abide in my word, then you're my disciples and you will know the truth, a very intimate knowing. He said, if you, they will know the truth so that, number three, they will come to their senses and have a sound mind. And then number four, escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. So here is a process. Now, if I'm the person who is, who is struggling, it would be helpful for me to understand this process. And if I'm the person helping someone who's struggling, it would be beneficial for me to understand this process. It seems that people, as they're struggling and moving from a place of bondage to freedom, they have to go through these certain phases. The first thing that has to happen is God has to do something. He has to grant them repentance. But then they move forward, progressively moving toward freedom. And so the point is, this process probably will take time. And the struggler needs support as he's going through that. So I might look at that and say, we well, you know what you need? You're repeatedly sinning. You know it's wrong. You keep doing this. Uh, you just need to repent. And I would be correct, right? He does need to repent. Uh, but perhaps, like a lot of people I work with, he has attempted to, to repent many times. He's prayed for God to help him. Maybe he doesn't understand the obstacles he's facing. And maybe he needs to be able to understand that this specific moment in your life is, is where repentance is needed. You are opposing something that you actually need. That's a very complicated, or it can be a, a complicated situation. One more passage, Romans chapter 15. Paul says, we then who are strong, capable, able, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. So Paul says you have a weak person. Those of you who are strong, meaning the weak person is someone who is unable, right, without power. Those of you who, who are able should bear with this person. Because weak people have what Paul calls scruples. Scruples, I like that word. The English definition of scruples is, is a, it's a feeling of doubt or hesitation about uh, a moral decision, right, uh, and, a, and a course of action. In other words, the person is unsure, maybe confused, insecure, doubtful. Uh, that person is going to need some bearing with. It's gonna, he's going to need or she's going to need us to be patient. And Paul intentionally says, don't please yourself when you're caring for people. It's not about you. It's about that other person, right? So to care well, we have to understand where an individual is in their growth and healing process, and we meet them right there. And timing is very important. One last passage before Elaine comes up. Jesus said to his disciples, preparing them for his departures, he said, I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So Jesus is saying, you guys need to hear a lot more stuff, but you're not ready. Like, you can't handle it right now. And I believe that's how God deals with us. I believe he, there's so many things he knows about us that he's not telling us. And he's not going to tell us until we're ready to hear it. So if you are, find yourself in a place where you're having memories or things that you thought were long gone and here they are showing up again, 
Might I suggest that God has been gracious to keep that from you? But now you're ready. You're ready to see it. And he's ready to heal you from, from that. So I want to get, I ask Elaine to come up. And uh, I'm so appreciative of Elaine, her insight, her perspectives, so valuable. So uh, I think we should give her a round of applause. She loves rounds of applause. Thanks, Tim. So I get to talk to you about the second half of this talk because it's something that's very dear to my heart. So Tim was so gracious to ask me to do this. Uh, let me begin by reading a proverb to you that offers practical words of caution. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. We can't simply assume that we know exactly what someone needs. We have to be patient enough to explore what they're saying, what they're telling us, and understand their struggle well before we speak into it. That's when God gives us his word to be able to apply it in a gentle, loving way. Proverbs 25:11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And you've probably heard this saying before, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So when we care more about a person's behavior than their heart, we send a message that's uncaring. And when we focus on a person's performance, rather than seeing their true need, we miss an opportunity to care for them well. Compassion and care involve entering the person's world, understanding what it's like to walk in their shoes. Let's look at a few ways that we can build involvement and some entry here at gates that might help. Um, Paul Tripp calls these opportunities for connection. These entry gates are a few examples. So pay attention to this. Listen for emotional words. That would be words like, I'm angry, I'm afraid, or I can't stop crying. So you're listening for these words when you're in conversation with people. Listen for interpretive words, words that tell you how they're processing things, like this shouldn't be happening, I guess I'm getting what I deserve, or I wonder if it's even worth getting up. And one that I heard this, this week was, um, I'm not really worth the space that I take up. Listen for self-talk. I'm such a failure. This always happens to me. I don't have what it takes to face this. And listen for God talk. This is how they view God. I thought I was doing what God wanted. He simply doesn't hear my prayers. How could God let this happen to me? So we can see that we're listening a lot. And as we build involvement, we gain a platform to speak truth into people's lives. Connecting with people is an art. We all know this because we see it played out daily through manipulation and coercion. We see it everywhere in many different professions. But we aren't in a position to correct those wrongs. But we can do our part to make sure that the people who walk through our lives are loved well. So I want to introduce you to a concept that Tim and I um, like to call relational hospitality or conversational hospitality. The dictionary defines hospitality as a quality or disposition of receiving and treating guests and strangers in a warm, friendly, generous way. Another definition of hospitality that's dear in my heart and means more to me is that hospitality is the flesh and muscles on the bones of love. You cannot have a body functioning properly in love, the skeletal system, without the bones, without the flesh and the muscles. 
and we are those to one another. God's word commands us to practice hospitality. In Paul's letter in, to Titus, he's given the qualifications of an elder, and he basically makes a list of all the things that makes a bishop blameless, such as not being self-willed or quick-tempered or given to wine, not violent or greedy for money. The King James Version, well, then he goes on to say, don't do all those things, but rather in Titus 1.8, he says, he must be hospitable. And then comma, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. That's a tall order. But let me add right here that it takes an enormous amount of self-control and discipline to practice relational and conversational hospitality. In fact, when talking to the saints of God in the book of Romans, Paul gives us explicit teaching on how to be a living sacrifice. In Romans 12, 9, chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, he says, Let love be genuine. Abhor or hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation and constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. And there it is again. Seek to show hospitality. And I just want to add that soul care is rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, and constant in prayer, and given to hospitality. I think we all could agree, as Tim said earlier, that the pandemic in 2020 caused many of us to become creative in how we showed hospitality, especially in a time of isolation. Hospitality is usually thought of in the context of home. We make our homes welcoming. We're hospitable. We invite people into them. We prioritize their needs. Um, you're friendly and you desire for them to be comfortable. Being hospitable to guests means that we're prioritizing them. We ask them if we can take their coat. We ask them if they need something to drink. We're looking out for their well-being. You show honor and you make them as welcome as possible. Well, the same is true about conversational hospitality. So when you enter a conversation with someone, be sure to show them honor. Prioritize them. Ask yourself, what is most important to them right now? Help them to feel comfortable in your presence. Look them in the eye. Serve them. Ask questions that show honor and convey that you're interested in them. Relational hospitality is creating a safe relational environment of care. Here's some self-assessment questions that we can use to determine how we're perceived by other people. This is going to be challenging. Every time I read through these questions, I am so challenged. Because I am a conversationalist, and if you've ever had a conversation with me, you know that. I enjoy conversation. So here's our questions. Are you easy to talk to? Do you show genuine interest in people and conversations? Do you ask questions that draw them in? How do people experience you? Or... Do you talk about yourself? Do you tell people how much you know? Do you frequently correct people in your conversation? Do you intimidate people and make it difficult for them to share their struggles? Your approach to people will determine how welcome they feel in your presence. So we're choosing to honor and value people. So expressing honor has to be genuine. All of us can tell when someone is not genuine. It's very easy. Remember what we read in Romans 12, and it's worth repeating. 
Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love, and in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. Look at Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So we can see that this idea of conversational hospitality or relational hospitality is a very self-sacrificing type of work, type of care, type of love. I uh, recently saw this played out in real time at our grandson's adoption. People from our community showed up in large numbers and there weren't, they weren't there for any reason other than to show support. The courtroom was packed. It was in the middle of the work day. So many people had to leave their jobs and many had to drive far distances to be there. But they received nothing in return other than knowing the satisfaction that they were there showing love and support to us. To me, this was a great display of hospitality. And I was overwhelmed. I was a mess of tears. But when the adoption was over, we were all standing in the midday hot Texas sun out here at the Gurney Courthouse. And it was overwhelming just saying hello to everyone. We had gifts, we were wrangling grandchildren. It was just chaotic. And all of a sudden, uh, Pastor Jason walked up and said, how can I help you? And of course, I shut him off. I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he's like, where do these things need to be? I'll take them there. He gathered all the things and walked them across the parking lot and put them where they belonged. And I'm not sharing this to embarrass you. But it was such a moving moment for me. You see, Pastor Jason could have been busy uh, connecting with people and, uh, you know, trying to uh, share the gospel. But he put caring for his sheep ahead of that. And he showed such hospitality. And I just want to throw in that Pastor Chad helped him call those things to the van. So... I feel like we have great examples of this among us. Our pastors are showing us how to love and how to care for one another. Um, people today don't expect to be cared for. They don't expect to be honored or loved. Our society is conditioned to be on the defense, expecting judgment, expecting pushback and criticism and correction. So when we reach into their lives with humility and we offer hospitality, warmth, and the love of God, we're setting the stage for soul care to begin and for the ministry of Jesus to take place. Because Jesus is compassionate toward the weak. He is patient with those who struggle. He is sympathetic to the hurting and the suffering. So as we build involvement with people, showing genuine care, we may earn the platform to speak into their life. And I want to close with a word of caution to all of you. From Romans 14, 4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make his king. Pastor Jesus. Thank you for that, Tim and Elena. That was incredible. Uh, Daniel's going to make his way up here. And uh, as we had uh, as we had talked about, uh, we want to make this. Uh, conversational, and I know starting next week it'll get a little more conversational. While you guys were sharing, uh, I was I was thinking of a uh, uh, a testimony that I heard just the other day. Uh, one, a lady in our church was on a, a mission trip, and she had got to a point where she uh, 
she was really asking the Lord, like, God, why, why am I here on this trip? I, I know you called me, but, but I haven't really seen you move or really had that sense or connection on why I'm here. Um, and then the next day, uh, they got up and, and she went to a, a brothel. And, and she went in, and, and there were about 10 to 12 ladies there. They, they were prostitutes. And uh, she, she wanted to, to love on them and, and share the good news of Jesus. And she, she tried to sit down in the dirt with them. And when she did, they, they were appalled uh, at her getting down in the dirt. And, and they refused. And even though she tried several times, it, they, they set up a seat for her uh, and a seat of honor. And, and they got her up off the ground and... Uh, she sat in that seat reluctantly, and then through a translator, they they talked for a period of time, and, and finally the conversation got to this climactic moment where, where basically through the translator, the lady said, listen, they don't think you can actually understand or connect with where they are and where they've come from in the least bit. Now it so happens that... Uh, uh, this dear lady has uh, a testimony. She began to unfold and share that testimony about her own abuse that she had gone through in her, in her first marriage and, and a lot of the fear and things that she had uh, involved with. And She said, there, there are many things that I can't understand, but I can't understand. She just began to connect with them. After she shared... They were moved and they, they invited her to come sit down in the dirt with them. And she did. She shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. And right there, 12 of those ladies prayed to receive Christ as their Savior. Now I share that story because a lot of what we're talking about, you may not always have the perfect testimony and God opens those doors. Sometimes you will. You have a testimony that you can use and that God will use. But I think that, that story goes a long way just to describe the separation that we have with people, the walls that are there. Even though they're invisible, there's walls that are there. And, and the art and the importance of connecting with people and God opening doors and you being patient and sensitive to those, to those cues. And, and sometimes it happens in one afternoon, but that's pretty rare, guys. We will acknowledge in the course of our regular life it, it takes time, it takes relationship capital uh, to connect with people and to be sensitive and to be trusted by people. We don't often trust people just on the spot. A lot of times that's a God moment, a, a breakthrough. Trust has to be earned, you know that? Trust has to be earned. And, and they did just a phenomenal job of, of listing out uh, ways that, that you can earn people's trust and be cued into uh, revealing that you are a safe place and you're a person that people can trust. Yeah, when we were, when I was looking through the notes ahead of time, I got, I got, you know, we get to cheat a little bit and see, see where we're going a little bit ahead of time. And thinking through uh, the phrase you had here, as you build involvement, you're going to gain that platform to speak the truth. The, the thing that resonated with me there, the word that kind of kept coming back is, is time. Right? It's like that building involvement, investing relationally. I think a lot of times when, when, we're, when we're excited to help somebody, when we know someone has a need, they, they've got something going on, we can see it, our hearts go out to them. We want to fix them right away. At least I know I do. It's like, I've got the answers. Right? We've got it in Scripture. I can just give this to you. And, and I'll invest relationally by, we'll go to lunch. right? And, and over lunch, I'll just... I'll, I'll, you know, that's, that's relational. We're eating a meal, and I'll just give it all to you right there. But that doesn't typically, that's not what we mean by that, is it? Like, Did you guys catch that? Yeah. You can't just pay for someone's lunch and then give them a 45 minute sermon? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like I've got, a, I've got a gun full of bullets, and I'm going to buy your lunch, and then I'm just going to I'm gonna shoot every one at you at one, one shot, and you're going to get it, and it's all going to soak in. And, and your eyes are going to be open. It's something you've spent a lifetime wrestling with. It's all going to be fixed. You know, because I invested in you relationally. That's not a one-time thing. And I think it's so easy to get discouraged 
as the person trying to take these, these truths, these biblical principles, things that maybe have brought healing in our own lives, and we want to help someone, but it can be very discouraging when we maybe even subconsciously go into it with, with that idea that, hey, one or two times, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be good. Well, then, it, 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 Tim, you said, God doesn't deal that way with us. Amen? God doesn't deal that way with us. And that is the, the key, right? Um, and that is, we are called to be the hands and feet of Christ. And in your own life, isn't he patient to bring stuff up? I thought that was brilliant, the, the thought of if memories are suddenly flooding back, and maybe God has been patient in the past, and now he's reminding you of that, that is... That is off the charts good because he is so kind and patient to deal with us throughout our lives and to pull stuff out when he thinks the time is right. Now is the time to deal with this. Uh, very important. That's how patient God is with each of us. And one thing that I wanted us to take a few minutes, make sure our time doesn't completely get away. I know so much of what we're doing is trying to equip each of us as, as the body of Christ to be able to minister to one another, right? So to just be on that journey with people who, who are struggling, who are hurting, who are wrestling with emotional and mental and, and just deep, deep things that are going on in their lives. And so this week, our prayer has been this will be very helpful for you. But I also know in this room, and you may be both of those people, you may be someone who has a heart to learn and grow so you can be used by the Lord in someone else's life. But as you're sitting here, you're also thinking, but I need this too, right? I've got these things in my life and, and I need someone to, to walk with me through this. I'm broken. I'm kind of at the end of my rope in ways. And maybe that is why you're here. Like, I'm hoping to get answers for my own life from this, right? I'm, I'm, that's really as far as I can see right now is what's going on in my life. And so even as I read the, these statements and, um, you know, and at the end where you were talking about who he is, that he's compassionate and he's patient and he's sympathetic, just thinking through, right? We want to be those things for others, but Christ is that for us and so even just that that reminder that if if you're sitting here and you're going through through things and you're looking for for hope you're looking for for answers that you can, biblical truth you can apply to your life like that reminder wait a minute even if i haven't found someone else who will walk with me <laughs> flesh and blood beside me Christ jesus is he he is that uh, Jason and I this afternoon were talking through a passage in 1 John uh, that just talks about who who he is. I'll read the passage and then I just wanted us to just unpack it for just a minute. In, in 1 John chapter 2, he says in verse 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. For he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for those of the whole world. That word advocate is so important to understand. Yeah, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Let's, yeah, and let's talk about that word for a minute, because I think this is such a critical place for us to understand who he is. So how many know that Jesus is our mediator or our intercessor okay jesus is what that word means right so so think about the fact that there is a holy god who is unlike any other being he is holy there is no one like him he dwells in unapproachable light A mediator or an intercessor is one who is like a priest and stands between the two of you and communicates because you, you, you can't quite get or process what is coming from the magnificent 
Yeah, you're holy, yeah. the one who dwells in unapproachable light. So, so he is the go-between, the halfway between, the one that you can look at, and he knows, and, and this is his father, and he so he, he can communicate on your he is one who stands in between. Okay. We're so broken. We can't. Yeah, we can't. We can't hear. We can't understand. We can't receive from the Father what He wants to give us because of our brokenness. Do we all? Can we acknowledge that's all of us, right? That 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 is us. Yes. Yeah, so Jesus is. But me. this, but this word advocate, it's different. And remember the context here in First John chapter two. It says when you sin, okay. Jesus becomes your advocate. An advocate. Now, what would you expect when you sin that mediator would do? Okay, you may imagine, well, he will run the other way, right? The advocate, no, is not one who stands between. An advocate is one who is like your own personal lawyer. And comes and stands beside and argues on your behalf, articulates for you, in defense of, is one who is advocating for. Okay? That is your advocate. He doesn't just stay in between, he comes and stands beside. This is the gospel, right? That you have. Uh, that you have the Son of God who has come and draws so near that in your worst moments He assumes the position of your advocate. So when, when we're when we're applying this about soul care and one who comes alongside of, we're just trying to walk in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, who. This is the way he is with you before the holy judge of the universe. He is standing beside you, pleading. Even in your sin, he is pleading that his blood covers, that you are his, that he has atoned. Isn't that magnificent? So we wanted to circle up with that. And make sure that, yes, we've pressed into all the things. We know what makes good communication, and a lot of this is good, helpful tools. But all of this flows from God himself. And how he is to each one of us. Because at the end of the day, you won't have the power the will, the capacity to overflow in love like this to others unless he is your supply, right? He has to supply it. It's only because he has comforted me do I long to comfort others. Amen? Amen. Without getting into like you know preaching this passage, which is very tempting to want to do, um, give two preachers mics back and forth <laughs> and, and a good passage, and it's, it could get it could get out of hand in a hurry. Like, I, this is so important. That's why I've loved conversations with with Tim and Elaine, just talking about you know how God has convicted them to to counsel and to to, to come alongside and to care just. It's rooted in Scripture. It's rooted in the Gospel and what the Gospel has done for us positionally, right? Like whether we feel it or not, whether it, whether we always, you know, realize it when we get out of bed every morning, who we are in Christ, like it's still true, right? But to keep preaching it to ourselves, like that's so good and that's so right and that's exactly where healing comes from is understanding that. And so... Even this pastor saying he is our advocate. He is the one who comes and stands beside us. But John didn't even stop there. He says, and he himself, Jesus himself, is the propitiation 
for our sin. In other words, he is the one who satisfied the dead. He is the one who satisfied the demands of a holy God so that we could be secure, so that we could have peace with God, which is where healing <laughs> comes from, right? The, and so even this, even as we continue in, in that passage to just, for us to be able to stop and think, right, what Jesus has provided for us, right? He is that advocate who comes beside, he stands beside us, he walks beside us, he is with us, Right, but even more than that, he is the one who took our place and he paid that debt so that we could say, hey, even in my brokenness, I still can know, right, on the authority of the blood of Jesus, that I am, I am whole before God because Jesus has paid for it. He is the one who has satisfied and done what I could never do. And so I can walk out in that and apply that. that daily. I think that is another important thing in my own life to remember um, so many times. So Tim and Elaine, you, you had mentioned uh, sometimes caring for people can be uh, messy. And uh, you like ironing because you can see. You I used I used to like you used to like ironing. <laughs> That's gone away. Now now I wash dishes. It left me with the dishes. So I like uh, dishes better than ironing too. E either of you can answer this, but uh, um, maybe te maybe say some either success stories or just answer the the question. Right? Uh, even though it's hard and it's messy and at times there's not immediate results. Uh, uh, is it worth it? Is it rewarding? And why is it worth it or rewarding? I would say it's 100%. I'm short. I know y'all can't see me. 100% um, worth it. Um, I really think that when you engage people on this level that we've talked about tonight, and you are privileged and honored to sit in their journey with them. It is a sacred and holy place. And I really love what you guys said about an advocate because before I go into a conversation with someone, you better believe I've petitioned the Lord to be present. And throughout the entire time, you're just, the person is talking, you're engaged, you're hearing, but you're also praying, God, give me wisdom, give me love, give, help me to know how to bring hope and encouragement here. And just quite truthfully, there are times when I think Jesus speaks up and I'm like, where in the world did that come from? And I, you guys have probably experienced that, um, you know, where he just does his work through you. Because I love something Tim taught me a long time ago. He said, Elaine... We are just the garden hose. We're hooked up to the spigot. And our job is to keep from king in the hose. <laughs> so that's our job. Don't kink the hose. And if you don't kink the hose, God will flow through you. Good yeah, I, that was, I agree with her. You agree with her. Okay. Yeah. All right, I've got a question. I'm going to keep, we're just going to keep putting yeah, guys on the spot for a minute. All right, talk for a minute in ministry. Right, it's, it's easy uh, sometimes to just try to, you know, run on things we've studied, things we've learned in the past, quiet times we've had, devotions we've had, studies we've done. But talk for a minute about just the, the habits, the disciplines in your all's lives, just to continue uh, to feed to feed yourselves um, spiritually, and the importance of that. How you go about doing that, just so that you're, um, like I said, so that you are ready, walking into these situations, walking alongside people. It, it can be very draining. It can it can take a lot out of you. So. What is it you guys do to make sure that you're continuing 
uh, to be filled up spiritually that, that you've seen helpful? Uh, so that has been uh, a little eclectic for me because um, I come from a, a self-destructive life, so I haven't been really good at caring for myself. Uh, I've learned a lot more, and I'm, I'm much better at it now. Uh, but I uh, will, my dad uh, really prioritized work. Like, that's how the best thing you can do is work. And you, when you don't know what else to do, work. And so uh, I have to really carve out time to be alone and to carve. We, we usually do morning time. We like to be together, so it's hard. But we get up and we go into different rooms, and, uh, and we're just, that's our time with the Lord. Usually that's uninterrupted. Uh, but we, I think we have learned, I can speak for myself, I think I've learned to separate ministry from my personal walk with God. I, I feel like you and I are God's agents. Like we are his tool. And sometimes we show up and we're in really good shape. And sometimes we're mumbling and fumbling around. He still uses us. And so the if we just show up, and I think ministry, this, I love this definition, ministry is for the facilitation of God doing his work. So if we just show up, God will do his work. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that if God used you in someone's life, that you are awesome and it's because you're, you're you know, in really good shape or you've been spending a lot of time with the Lord and that's why he's using you. Maybe it could be that. But what I've learned is God is able to use every situation we're in. You know, Second Corinthians talks about we're clay pots or jars of clay or broken vessels. And, and his light shines through that. So we don't have to be presenting ourselves as perfect because we're not. That would be an illusion. But to be able to present ourselves as we genuinely are. And uh, I don't think I'm answering your question. I'm kind of chasing the rabbit, sorry. But I, I think, uh, I think we, you know, we're not, as, we're not sufficient in ourselves. So it's not like we have to do all of our reps and get it, get it ready so we can go out into the game. Uh, you can roll out of bed and go into the game because it's not really you doing that work. It's God. He is our sufficiency. But if I forget that, that's when we get in trouble. So crimp, crimping the hose, if you will, is when I'm self, self conscious. I'm nervous. How people, how are people? looking at me, what do they think about me? All of those types of thoughts hinder God's spirit from flowing through us. So the best we can do is to present ourselves as genuine and as honest as we possibly can. And that's the most powerful place for us to be in ministry, I think. Which is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is basically being a Jed Clampett Christian. You know, Jed Clampett had billions, but he was Jed Clampett. And he had all he needed to offer, but no one knew it. And I think sometimes we want to look the part of the billionaire, and we want to act the part of the billionaire. Um, and just to show the difference between Tim and my personalities, um, Tim, one of the things I love about him is his chill. His, you know, he says he struggles with anxiety, but one of the ways he deals with that is by just chilling out, you know, and, and relaxing. Um, Tim actually has a soul budget. Um, it's, a, it's actually a piece of paper that we use to monitor our soul and the health of our souls. And we look at what things are income sources to us, and we try to make sure we have those things on the calendar. I'm the calendar girl. And I usually have to say, Tim, you need soul rest. And he's like, oh, yeah, right. I need soul rest, you know. Um, but we look at those things. What things deplete our soul? What things, you know. And we try to keep that balance. Um, but I totally agree with Tim. There's nothing. There's all the things we do. You may see us running the streets of Bernie together. We wear ear pods and we don't talk during that time. Sometimes, some days we have to because we got an issue we have to resolve. But most days we have an ear pod and we are learning something new. We are, we are both pretty avid learners and we love God's word. And so that is 
Those are the tools we use. And we're always trying to sit at the feet of people like this so we can learn more. All right, we are out of time, and so we're going to land this plane. Uh, Daniel, what about the cards for questions? Um, did you guys, some of you guys take no cards home last week? Did you fill them out? Did you have questions? Um, are there any out tonight? I was not up here when we got started. Um, the, pur see. the purpose of those cards is going to be, and, and again, we're going to hit this hard next week because we're jumping into is that anxiety yeah. first. So anxiety is next week. And as we go through those cards, we, we want you to have the ability to write your questions down. If there's specific situations um, that you want to give a little detail to, don't use names, but like uh, if you want to hit on some of those to make sure that we are addressing some of those. And then next week, uh, at the end, we can certainly take uh, raised hands. But some of you might not want to raise hands with 150 people in here. Uh, you might want to write that on the card. So that's the purpose of, of those cards, okay? Any questions just as they come up to, to make sure that we address them. How many weeks are we going to spend on anxiety? Just one. One? Okay. That's not enough. But that's what we're so if you took a note card, make sure, write that down. If you didn't, Take a piece of paper at home this week and write it down and bring it with you when you come back on Wednesday. And we'll start going through those and try to try to discuss some of the, the questions, the scenarios, the different things maybe that you're dealing with. Okay? That way it's much more interactive as we get into some of these things. Alright? Alright. Good night. <laughs>